Today's scripture comes from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way of the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her Lord. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with the respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Thank you, Lord, for your word. And thank you, Grace, for uh, reading that with, for us here today. Uh, hey, Faith family, uh, in the house and uh, at your own house. Uh, and those of you here, when you came in, did you get this little card with the, with the purple ribbon on it? Um, no? You did. Okay, good. Uh, anyway, uh, this time last year, we participated in a worldwide prayer movement called Thy Kingdom Come, and we're doing it again this year. Uh, along with Christians from more than 80 denominations and 172 countries. Wow. Uh, and we're invited to pray for five people we know that they would come to know Jesus. And so it starts Thursday, which is called Ascension Day. We don't really have services that day, but it's the 40 days after Easter, and we remember the day that Jesus was physically, you know, lifted from the earth and ascended to heaven. And so we're going to pray uh, for that day, for 11 days, and this marks the time when Jesus' people prayed and waited in Jerusalem. And on the 11th day, Pentecost Sunday, that was when the Holy Spirit was poured out on Jesus' people and empowering them to go out with love and boldness to share the good news. Now, I have to apologize for something on this card because I wrote the copy for this card. I mean, I did it. Pentecost Sunday is not June 25th. The 25th is not even a Sunday. It's June 5th. So you got to kind of that out there, the two, and dang, my bad. All right. Anyway, the idea is to pray for at least five minutes for five people uh, each day and uh, and by the way, there's also a Thy Kingdom Come app, which has some great little stuff in it for praying and videos and other stuff you can look at. One more thing, Vacation Bible School starts in just three weeks, as Miss Leah said. Three weeks? It will be the best week of your summer, and we have opportunities for 100 volunteers, adults and, and students. So... Scan that QR code on the screen or type in that tiny URL. Either one will take you to our, our sign-up website, and you can do it right now. I'll wait. <laughs> anyway, a church-wide text with the link is also going to go out today, and uh, there are going to be many, and there are many kinds of ways to help. Uh, so, anyway, that's enough of that. Let's pause and pray together that prayer that Jesus taught us. Will you pray with me as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, today is the fifth Sunday in our series, You Are Made for This. And today's message has the unusual title about an attractive spouse. A friend of mine uh, attended Bethel College 
many years ago, and, and he said that the student's favorite Bible verse at Bethel College was Amos 4.4. Let's move on to the next slide, if you would. Thank you. There we go. Anyway, uh, it was Amos 4.4, come to Bethel and sin. Wouldn't you just love to see that verse spray painted on the dorm, you know, your first day of bringing your kid to college, you know, come to Bethel and sin. Anyway, I bring that up because it's easy to misread the Bible. It's easy to pluck a verse out of its context and make, you can make it say almost anything. And, and today's scripture can easily be misread. And that's why every Sunday I aim to set each week's passage in its historical, cultural, and literary context. So grab a Bible. If you didn't bring one, there should be one in front of you. Uh, to 1 Peter chapter 3, 3, we're going to start with verse 1. And while you're doing that, let me, let me share a few things. That in ancient Greek and Roman cultures, a woman was expected to defer to her husband in all things. In the Roman Empire, the husband even had the legal right to kill their unwanted newborns, regardless of what his wife wanted. And those discarded infants were much more likely to be girl babies because girls were seen as an economic drain on the family. And as you can imagine, then after a while, wives became hard to find. Not enough, not enough females in the population. But Christian families did not dispose of their baby daughters. They saw all children as precious uh, like Jesus did. And as the Jesus movement grew in the 40s and 50s and 60s AD, it was more and more likely that the women available to be married would be Christian women raised in Christian homes. Uh, so it was not uncommon for Christian women in the first few centuries to marry men who worshipped the traditional Roman gods. But that, you see, presented a problem. It was customary in Greek and Roman cultures for the wife to adopt the religion of her husband. Christian wives did not do that. They did not go with their husbands to the temple of Caesar. They did not participate in offerings to the pagan gods. They did the unsubmissive thing of sticking with Jesus. And because child-rearing was the duty of the mother, they also did the unsubmissive thing of bringing up their children in the way of Jesus. Today's research shows that the healthiest, most durable marriages are the ones where a husband listens to his wife and lets her influence him. Do you think that's true? Uh, it's, it's like in, in the movie, My Big Fat Greek Wedding. Maria shares a secret with her daughter. She says, let me tell you something, Tula. The man is the head, but the woman is the neck and can turn the head any way she wants. <laughs> in this paragraph, Peter's talking directly to Christian wives who have non-Christian husbands. Now, Peter knows that the movement of Christianity is toward equality. Yes, there are passages like women should remain silent in church, but I believe that that's addressing a specific problem, and it's not a general rule. And one reason I believe that is because in the broader context of the New Testament, it's clear that the church grant, when the church gathered, women were allowed to speak. Mary Magdalene and her friends the, announced the good news of Jesus' resurrection to the men. It was the first Easter sermon. Philip's daughters were prophets. Priscilla was a teacher. Chloe hosted weekly church gatherings in her home. Junia was an apostle. Phoebe was a deacon and carried the Apostle Paul's most important letter to Rome. And she probably helped them understand it. Let's keep this in mind as we go through this passage today, okay? Verse 1 says, Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands. Now, the phrase, in the same way, points back to chapter 2, where Peter tells Jesus' people to submit to the governing authorities. Now, 
we, we learned last Sunday that this is, this is a qualified submission. I mean, whenever possible, respect the laws of the land. But our first loyalty is to the Lord. Then at the end of chapter 2, Peter addresses slaves. Now, when all the sisters and brothers in Christ got together, in their eyes, nobody was a slave. I mean, everyone was, was free, and, and, and slaves could even be appointed as leaders in the church. But they couldn't always change their legal status with the government. So Peter tells them to submit to their masters, that is, do your work, do your job, which they did get paid for, by the way. But their first loyalty is to Christ. And then in the beginning of chapter 3, Peter seems to be a, responding to a question, something like this. As a Jesus follower, how do I treat my spouse who is not a Jesus follower? And that's a good question, maybe, for some of you. Uh, as a Jesus follower, how do I treat my spouse who is not? Now, ideally, husbands and wives will share their faith in Jesus, but not always. At the start of verse 1, Peter says, Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands. Well, what does submit mean? In chapter 2, it means to show respect. In chapter 5, Peter uses the word submit more to mean to be humble. So Peter's simply telling these Christian wives to show humility and respect to their pagan husbands. And the hope is this. Let's read the rest of verse 1. So that if any of them do not believe the word, that is the word of the gospel, they may be won over without words by the behavior of of their wives. Now, Christian wives, as I said before, are already doing the unsubmissive thing by not going along with their husband's religion. So Peter says, well, don't rock the boat needlessly. Be a respectful, humble wife. Honor your husband. And did you, did you notice the phrase without words? Miss Leah talked about that in her children's time. And that's because your spouse, or it could be your parents, your kids, your siblings, they may not be receptive to talking about Jesus right now. There are times when words, or at least very many words, are, they're going to backfire on you. So pray and, and, and attempt to increase their curiosity by your behavior, by how you treat them, by how you live your life. Be a blessed friend. Be a blessed spouse. And verse 2 adds, when they see the purity and reverence of your lives, then maybe, just maybe, someday they'll say, I want what she has. Now, it's no guarantee, but we've seen it happen. And then in verses 3 and 4, Peter tells wives that they are more likely to attract their, their pagan husbands to Christ, not with superficial beauty, but with a deeper kind of beauty. Verse 3, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles, the wearing of gold jewelry, or fine clothes. Now, I don't think he's per forbidding hairstyles. I mean, y'all got to comb your hair one way or another, right? And I don't, I don't think he's forbidding jewelry or, or nice clothes. He's saying that these things are not going to attract your husband to Jesus. There's a better way. Verse 4, rather it, that is your beauty, should be that of your inner self, that unfading beauty of a, of a gentle and quiet spirit which is of great worth in God's sight. And just so you know, in Christian circles, a gentle and quiet spirit is not just a feminine trait. It's not just for women. Gentleness is a quality that Jesus had. Gentleness grows in us when we, it's one of the fruit of the Spirit, when we yield to the Holy Spirit. And then what is, it, what is a quiet spirit that it says there? Well, I think James 1 verse 19 points to that when he tells all Christians to be quick to listen and slow to speak. Listen first before you talk. 
Peter adds that this holy behavior has been around at least since Israel's matriarch, Sarah. You know, when you read, go to the book of Genesis and you read about Sarah and Abraham, you'll find that Abraham, his ideas were not always right. And, and uh, even when Sarah followed them, it was, sometimes it messed things up. And sometimes Abraham went along with Sarah's ideas. I mean, I just say that because they did not have a top-down, one-way relationship. So remember that as we read verses 5 and 6. It says, For this is the way the holy women of the past, who put their hope in God, used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her Lord. And the word Lord in the Bible is kind of like the word Señor in Spanish. Some of you learned a little Spanish? Señor can be used to refer to God or Jesus, meaning Lord, or you can use it as a simple term of respect, like Señor, Sir. Now, sure, back then this was a patriarchal culture, but Abraham, but, but calling Abraham her Lord did not mean that Sarah was her slave. It was rather an expression of respect. And then at the end of verse 6, the wives are told, you are her, that is Sarah's daughters. If you do what is right, do not give way to fear. Wives, respect your husbands. That is, be the kind of wife that will win his respect. And if he pressures you, to, to, to give up your faith in Jesus and go and worship his pagan gods, hold on, hold on to your own. That's why it says don't give way to fear. And then Peter turns his attention to Christian husbands. I don't know why he talks to wives for six verse and, and then men just for, set for one, you know. I think we need it more. Anyway, verse 7 starts out, Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives. What is a considerate husband? Considerate husband is kind. Considerate husband is thoughtful. A considerate husband finds ways to serve his wife. A considerate husband appreciates his wife. Most pagan husbands were not concerned about being considerate to their wives. They didn't care. And then Peter adds, and treat them with respect as the weaker partner. <laughs> I'm in trouble, aren't I? <laughs> right now, some of you are going to think, who are you calling weak? Don't you dare say, I am weak. Sorry. And you're right. I mean, it was this kind of language that has kept women sub subservient for centuries. But I believe that Peter intended just the opposite. So hear me out. If we were to measure the height of every adult here today, we'd find that the average height of women is less than the average height of men. Right? Right? And if you paired up all the men against women in arm wrestling matches, should we try it? Never mind. The, the men would win a lot more of those matches, although there's some women in here, I'd, I'd be afraid to arm wrestle. Yeah, I'm looking at some of you right now. And where it says the weaker partner, the word partner is, is a good translation, but literally it, it, it's the word vessel. So think of a pottery jar. One jar may be smaller and lighter than the other, but what really matters is what's inside the jar. It's saying, husbands, yeah, you've got a bigger vessel. <laughs> don't, but don't take advantage of your physical size and strength. Never threaten her to get your way. Treat her with respect. She deserves that. And Peter reminds men, he says, women that they are heirs with you of the gracious gift of life. 
A woman, a woman receives new life in Jesus exactly the same way that a man does. Her husband doesn't choose it for her. She comes to it on her own, by her own faith. It's interesting that even in the first century, more women than men became believers in the gospel. And maybe one reason is because it gave them dignity. And it told husbands to never bully their wives. At the end of verse 7, husbands are told that if you are considerate of your wives and if you do not take advantage of your size and strength, then nothing will hinder your prayers. Oh, you go, whoa. Does that mean something could hinder your prayers? So if you're rude to your spouse or if you take advantage of your physical or even your financial power, it's going to hinder your ability to pray. And if you do not repent, it may even squelch your desire to pray. And I, I, th I think Jesus said some things that point us to say that a person who shows no mercy, what mercy will they receive from God? One TV show that I have not watched in many years is The Bachelor and The Bachelorette. I remember watching it, you know, some, many years ago with some of my family and when it was out in the early years. And the only reason I watched it was so I could make fun of it. <laughs> which was kind of fun to do, actually. Do they, do they still talk in that show about having, I just feel this amazing connection. Do they do, they do that? <laughs> and nearly every season ends with a marriage proposal, right? But very few of them last. That's what I've learned. Very few of them last. And I wonder, is this our culture's model of love and marriage? Is this what we think it's all about? The Bible's wisdom on, on marriage may sound outdated to some, but when properly understood, when properly understood, it, it stands the test of time. Does Tricia, my wife, submit to me? Well, if that means she's a doormat, then no. I mean, if you know her, you know that, right? And that's the last thing I would want. But I can tell you that she's humble, and she respects me. She's gentle and empathetic, and she challenges me, me when I need it. And I need it. And I believe that she would say that I'm considerate of her and I try to be understanding and respectful now sometimes we have misunderstandings uh, we get irritated with each other and we say things we regret and we have to apologize and forgive and learn from it just like the rest of you what means the most to both of us though is that we share this gift of life in Christ. We love him and follow him together. Not all couples share that, I know. And, and if that's your case, I just want you to know that God is working in you. God is, is eager to work in you and through you and to, to elevate your, your spouse's desire and curiosity about Christ. Sometimes without words. Let's pray. Jesus, you are the Lord of lords and the King of kings. You are, the, you are one with the Father. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to you. You carried away our sins by your selfless sacrifice on the cross. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. And while we pray, I, I know some of you who are, who are here with us today are listening that, that all this is maybe kind of new to you. 
And yet you find yourself becoming curious about Jesus. You've been learning and also questioning, watching and wondering. And even now, maybe you're feeling this, this tug inside you. And so I would like to offer a prayer that you could also pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for calling me. I need what only you can give. Forgiveness of sins, a fresh start in life, a peace about my future, the promise of a life to come, and a, and a community of people with whom I can share the journey. And so now, Lord, I say yes to you. Because I know left to myself, I, I'm a mess. I can make a mess of my life. So I invite you to come in and make your home in me. I give all that I am to you. I'm all yours. In your name I pray. Amen. Let's stand.